this sermon's a little different. <laughs> Don't anybody freak out. Um, I introduce you today to the uh, Colt 45. This gun was manufactured and created in 1873 by Samuel Colt, and it changed the way that the world saw warfare, saw personal self-protection. Uh, so no one gets nervous, this one is empty. It was given to me by a very dear friend, and the last time it was fired was probably about 60 years ago. Would it still fire today? Probably. <laughs> probably. You'd probably want it checked out first. Anyway, that being said, the, uh, the peacemaker, again, like I said, changed the way that, that people protected themselves. Um, there was an old Western adage that once said that Abraham Lincoln made men free, Samuel Colt made them equal. As time's gone on, the, the firearm, as we've all known, um, has grown as a, as a personal protection weapon, and there's almost every home has at least one. Or if you live in Texas, 20, 25. <laughs> live in New York, maybe one or two. And uh, it's excellent protection today in this dangerous world we live in against robbers, burglars, people that wish to do you physical harm. But the thing is, there are people out there doing Satan's will along with Satan himself that want to do you spiritual harm. And in those cases, as powerful as this weapon was, it's absolutely worthless against that. You need a different weapon to fight that. Amen. This is probably more powerful than any weapon Colt ever created. Uh, not to get anybody overly excited about Colt, he wasn't a very nice man. <laughs> He uh, sold weapons to the north, the south. He'd sell them to anybody, no matter which side they were on, to make a buck. But again, he's changed the way uh, the world's viewed today. But what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to learn a little bit more about, is the ultimate weapon. How to use it. How to wield it. You know, no matter what weapon you have in your hand, any weapon, it could be the Colt 45, um, knife, baseball bat, it could be just about anything. If you don't know how to use it, you can end up doing more harm than good. And the same goes with the inspired word of God. You can do more harm than good. Today we're going to understand how it works and how to use it. It's um, easy to kind of see how the Colt can be used defensively or offensively. Can you still hear me okay without me breathing it like Darth Vader? Okay. All right. A single verse or passage, well understood and rightly applied, can be an extremely powerful weapon against Satan and his helpers, which uh, if you look around the world today, you'll realize are everywhere we look. The Word of God is a great defensive weapon. You can use a good relevant scripture to challenge and rebuke a false teaching. There are several examples in the Bible um, of the inspired Word of God doing so. Probably the best example that uh, most of us know is uh, when Jesus used scripture to beat back temptation of Satan's attack in the wilderness. It's, it's amazing to read that part. And, you know, it's funny. I, I haven't heard a lot of messages on that. But it was, it was a great testimony to the power of our God. In Matthew 4, 1 through 11, if you take taking notes, it says, And Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, that's a long time, people, he then became hungry, and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, I don't want you to miss something in this part of the scripture here, where it says, After 
40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry and the tempter came. Satan is always standing around waiting to pounce on us in our weakness. Always waiting until we're beat down, we're having a hard time in our lives. That's when he comes. But that's also when our weapon's the most important, is in those times. Not only is this an amazing weapon, but it's an amazing comforter in those times. Reese? What, 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 Reese? Okay. He's crawling on the floor. <laughs> now, also in 4, 1 through 11, it says, Then he took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, that so you will not strike your foot against stone. But then Jesus turned around and said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You should not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, because the devil's stubborn and persistent, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Now, note that every time Satan tempted Jesus, to satisfy his fleshly desires, fleshly pride, and ego, because that's what Satan was speaking to here. Fleshly desires, pride, and ego, which are the same things as, as men and women that uh, we're tempted by every day as well. So that's what Satan goes to. It's kind of his hands-on go-to. But Jesus countered each enticement with a, it is written. See, Jesus brought to the battle a very specific scripture, a very specific scripture that dealt with the very temptation that Satan was offering to him. You see, with the chosen scripture occupying the mind of Jesus, Satan and the temptation lost all power. It lost everything. So remember, when temptation comes our way, whether it be temptation to lose your temper, temptation to be greedy, maybe to become discouraged, indulge in sexual immorality, wallow in self-pity. We, we talked about that in Bible study this morning. Pity parties when you attend by yourself. That, that to complain, to drive over the speed limit, to get high, to get drunk, envious, jealous. It doesn't matter what it is. They're all things we struggle with. The temptation to lie or whatever else it is. We need to be able to block that temptation with the scripture that speaks to it. If we're thinking on and speaking with the scripture, again, Satan and temptation lose their power over us. And then you're on your way to overcoming it. Now, Another point on this passage in Matthew is that I want you to understand that Satan himself was quoting Scripture. In one of his attacks on Jesus, the devil used a portion of the word to encourage and provide a justification for Jesus to do what the devil wanted. So even Satan pulled in it as written. You see, the devil knows the Scriptures very well. He even knows the author. And he will use those scriptures to entice you to sin against God. He will twist those scriptures, take it out of context, allow you to believe and take it out of context, and I dare teaching that's contrary to the true will of God. So if you're not careful, Satan can use their own weapon against us. 2 Corinthians 11, 13, and 14, and this... Uh, it's funny that it's written over 2,000 years ago because this definitely still applies today, people. It said, For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. 
this passage is warning us that, that Satan has people disguised as servants of the Lord. Our handlebars are... Sometimes they use pastors and reverends and preachers, evangelists, friends, neighbors. The sad part is even family members. Satan will use your own family members. There are so many people today in this world that are teaching and preaching the Word of God, but sadly down underneath they're servants of Satan who preach and teach lies and distort the Word of God. And the only way you're going to be able to defend yourself from that is with the truth. The only way to protect yourself from false doctrine is with sound doctrine. When someone pulls in, it is written, we need to counter with, just like Jesus did. Well, on the other hand, it is written here. That's why I love what Monty says, don't just take my word for it, look it up for yourself. I love that. Now, if you're attending a church and your pastor never says something like that, you need to pray hard. Now, it's not that you can't trust Monty. I've, I've been with Monty 10 years now, and, and, and I I've, I've do fully trust Monty. I do. But by getting into the Word yourself, God may reveal something to you, something special just for you that he wasn't trying to reveal through Monty, something that, that he wanted to reveal to you alone. We were talking earlier, and, and, and Jack and, and Monty we were both talking about that the same thing that uh, there's this thing going around Facebook, um, you know, that God, when God speaks to you about a calling on your life, others may not understand it because it wasn't a conference call. Sometimes the word of God's not a conference call. Sometimes there's something he wants to speak specifically to you about. Amen. Now, the word of God is a great offensive weapon as well. There's a lot of power in this book. This is a weapon that you can use to inflict real damage on the works of Satan in the world. There are three ways that you can use the word to assault Satan's kingdom, and we're going to talk about those three. Number one is this exposes deeds of darkness. Ephesians 5.11 says, Having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness but rather expose them. You see, we're told not to participate in unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them for what they are. Now, I, I, and I don't want you to think I'm making excuses for people because I'm not, but there are people all around us who do or condone evil things because they don't know they're evil. It's because they don't know any better. They don't know that God speaks against it in his scriptures. Now, we're commanded by God to bring understanding to these people. To expose evil for what it is. Now, let me remind everybody that's out of love. Hey, don't, don't go beating somebody over the head. Although, God had to hit me with a two-by-four to get my attention. It says in Ephesians 5.13, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. So we know that dark or evil deeds have to be exposed by the light. So question is, what is the light? David says in Psalms 119.105 that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. He's saying this word lights our way. And it's our obligation as Christians to inform other people of the difference between the light and the darkness. If someone around us talks about something wrong as if it's okay, it's our job to tell them otherwise. If evil is being conducted before us, we must not be silent. We must stand up and say, hey, God's opposed to that. That's the problem today is people not having the bravery to stand up and say, hey, God opposes that. Now, the second way you can use 
this weapon against Satan, and, and this one's going on more and more and more every day, is to refute world philosophies and false religions. You know, it seems like every day you can read somewhere somebody's popped up with some new religion. You know, there's, there's even a group of people who've got together and they follow the force, the way of the Jedi in Star Wars. <laughs> it's true. I'm not making this up. Then, there, then, then there's a church of the spaghetti colander. You know, it, it, it's, it's easy to laugh about to think, you know, George Lucas is like, hey, I made this up for a movie, guys. Dianetics, L. Ron Hubbard. It's everywhere. And, and like I said in another sermon, people are searching to grasp onto something to give them hope. If we're not there to give them something to grasp onto, they'll grasp onto something else. Ephesians 3.18 says, May have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and how long and how high and deep is the love of Christ. They are darkened in their understanding because of the ignorance that is in them. Which teaches us to number three, need to educate people. That's why we have Bible studies. That's why we have church. That's why you should have a Bible. If you don't have one, let somebody know. I think we've got some here we can give you. I love our Bible study on Wednesday nights, um, and it's taken us a long time. We're, we're, we're up in the, in the Job, or, or Job, if you don't know how to pronounce it. And we started in Genesis, and what has it been, money, a year, year and a half, three years, and we're up to Job. But we're going through every single word in the Bible, every single word. What better way to learn it than to read it? Paul challenged the false beliefs of the culture around him. He wasn't real popular for it. In Acts 17, it says, When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. And as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. See, we have an account of his going to Athens in Greece first, and then in verse 17, he teaches to the Jews about how the Messiah had come. Then in verse 18, he goes to the philosophers and challenges their beliefs, preaching Jesus in the resurrection. And then in verses 22 through 31, he talks to the heathen idol worshipers and philosophers about the true nature of the one God. See, Paul was an equal opportunity offender. He covered everybody. But he told these idol worshipers and philosophers about the nature of one true God, about creation, about the origin of mankind, about Jesus, the resurrection, the coming judgment day. He educated them. And he even persuaded some of them to believe. Unfortunately, not all. I'll tell you, if what we do saves just one soul it was worth it it was worth it but we need to be able to refute the demonic inspired beliefs that prevail in culture today we need to contest the world philosophies that shape our society we have evolution materialism that's getting real popular these days narcissism moral relativism just to name a few, there's some I'm sure I can't pronounce any better. We need to prove the fallacies of false religions and entrap the souls of mankind today. You have Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, neo-paganism. That's just a real short list. I mean, I could probably go all day long on the false religions of the world, the church of the spaghetti colander. How do we combat these? with our weapon, the Word of God. 
You see, beyond the worldly philosophies and false religions, we need to correct those within Christianity who've been entrapped by false doctrine. Believe it or not, there's people within Christianity that have been indoctrinated with false doctrine. There was a church in Texas, you know, where they danced around with uh, rattlesnakes. And a pastor died of a rattlesnake bite. Anybody surprised? Anyone? No. So we have to understand that there are these false doctrines even with Christianity. As we read and learn the messages of the apostles in the New Testament, we see that they're frequently refuting false teachings that crept into the church. Paul warned us in 2 Timothy 3.13, evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And this is just as much true, if not truer, today as it was then. <clears throat> because today we see the fulfillment of Paul's words here. There's so many churches that claim to be the Lord's churches, but they're not. I'm not talking about this one. There's so many who believe themselves to be Christians, but they're not. They've been confused and blinded by false teachings. <clears throat> I want you to understand that if you are completely, solely committed to God and the Word of God, I promise you those that are believing the false teachings believe just as hard about that as you do. That's what makes this job so difficult for us. We need to use our weapon, the Word of God, carefully and out of love help them to know the truth. James 5, 19 and 20 says, Brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death. In other words, as Monty says, we don't shoot our wounded. Who in here hasn't made a mistake or messed up really bad? Anyone? Nick, put your hand. Look, we're friends, man. I know your mistakes, brother. <laughs> I was there for some of them. I mean, not part of them, but, you know. <laughs> we all stumble. We all have problems. But it's our job, as, as James is telling us, to turn them back from their ways. I was in a horrible place in my life once. And a, a great pastor, Brother Floyd Franks, God rest his soul, he's gone on to be with Jesus now. He reached a hand out to me and uh, turned me from the horrible things I was doing at the time. I can tell you I probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him at the time. God definitely used that man. But the third way we can use this against Satan's kingdom is to preach the gospel of salvation. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to be any of these things. You just have to use this going on the offensive to expose evil and refute worldly philosophies. That's all you have to do. We can save many great souls for the Lord if we would just use the weapon he gave us to learn how to use it. You know, quite a few generations ago, the members of God's church probably possessed a greater knowledge of the Scriptures they, they had to get into the Word. They didn't have YouTube. They didn't have the Internet. And who knows that not everything you see on the Internet is true? Why did they have a greater understanding? Because this is what they had to get into. They didn't have anything else. We need to get back to this. Now, I'm not saying that great YouTube-inspiring videos... Our TV pastors are wrong. But you need to get down to the old-fashioned Word of God. See, Paul had to rebuke Hebrew Christians for a similar mentality. <clears throat> In 5.12, he 
says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truth of God's word all over again. I mentioned this to Monty today. I found the sippy cup of milk on the floor. I'm like, I wonder who this belongs to. <clears throat> says, you need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use, constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So if you want to become an expert with this, first try reading it. Try reading the word. Colossians 3.16 tells us, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs of spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. There's nothing like opening this up, people. Reading the scriptures ourselves. Again, there are pamphlets, tracts, books. There are a million books, a million Bible studies. And those are great. But we got to get back to the Word of God. Because only by reading this ourselves can we see the big picture of things. They need glasses to read this one. This is pretty small. Um, but this is a Gideon Bible, and uh, they don't actually make this particular one anymore. These, these were awesome. We used to give these out at uh, rallies. But only by studying them themselves and getting deep into the Word can we use it. It's easy to misuse this by taking verses out of context. I knew a guy that took a verse out of the Old Testament out of context. It's the one about they, they cut down a tree and made an idol and adorned it. And so he believed that uh, Christmas trees were evil because of that verse. <clears throat> yeah, they had a whole chapter. Dean and I were doing uh, marriage counseling at one time. I don't know why God thought we needed to do that. I don't think he did. I think it was us. Had a guy, you know, he swore up and down that the husband's the head of the household and his wife needed to do what she was told because he read that in the Bible. Unfortunately, that was probably the only thing he'd ever read in the Bible. <laughs> because when I read the rest of that verse to him, he looked like a beat down whipped puppy. <laughs> they're, they're not married anymore. Um, it, 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 it's, sad, it's sad, but... But, you know, we can share the Word of God with people, but not everyone's willing to grasp onto it. But it doesn't mean we don't keep trying. Yeah, it doesn't mean it. Now, to become an expert in the Word, you need to pray. Psalms 119, 12 through 27 says, Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so I will meditate on your wonders. So before you start reading your Bible, I suggest everyone stop and 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 as we pray before a Bible study, Monty, Monty's prayer before Bible study is to help us understand it and gain something from it, something we can use apply to our lives. And over time, the more you read this, the greater understanding you'll get. Now it's important to memorize the scriptures. James 1.25 says, But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what he heard, but doing it. Not forgetting what he heard, but doing it. They will be blessed in what they do. It tells us that the forgetful hearer reader won't be blessed. If you ever uh, read an article in the newspaper and you just, half-heartedly read it and later on you don't even remember what you read that's because we don't meditate on that we read it while we're drinking our coffee we read it to pass the time at mcdonald's because they lay out a free paper they used to for covid and what you don't retain you can't apply in your life when we remember scriptures we'll have a better chance of recalling them in a time of need I remember Brother Jack, I'm going to call on Jack because Jack, Jack can take it. 
You know, he, he says one time, he says, well, you know, I read the scriptures and, and, and then, I, then I just can't remember them. And less than five minutes later, Jack's quoting scriptures. Guess what? Jack did remember them. When the time is right, God will help you recall the verse you need. Why do we need to recall that? So we can share it with others. Philippians 2, 15 and 16, which is the, the verse that uh, Chariots of Light stands on. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation like today, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain and have not labored in vain. We mentioned that second this morning with, with, with Dina that it's nice when you see a, a, a seed planted grow or come to fruition because we don't always get to. But I love it when that happens because it reminds us that we're not laboring in vain. Psalm 71, 15 says, My mouth shall tell of the righteousness and of thy salvation all day long. You see, God's shown you the truth. He's shown you the truth. He's revealed a wonderful promise to you. A promise of eternal life. And now it's your turn to share it with others. But to share it, you have to know it. You have to study it. You have to know your, your weapon. I know in the military that uh, they teach you how to break your weapon down in the dark. And put it back together in the dark. Why? Because if you're intimate with your weapon, if you're intimate with your weapon, then you're the most efficient you can be with it. And the more efficient you are, the better off you are, the safer you'll be, and the more you can help others. You know, fortunately, guns have become lighter over the years. If God has shown you this, how powerful of a tool the Bible can be. It is your duty and your job as soldiers of God's army. Some of you are soldiers of, of the U.S. Army. As part of God's army, it's your job to share the word of God, to bring others to Christ. If you don't know Christ yourself, if you're wandering around, you don't know how to use your weapon, or you don't have a weapon, speak to someone here. We'll get you a weapon. We'll get you a weapon. And for anyone to ask, this one's not for sale. But we will get you one free. We will get you a weapon. We got a stack of them in here. And I challenge you to read it and learn it and use it and apply it. Because only then can we win souls for salvation and defeat Satan. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you. We thank you for the weapon you've given us, Lord, the inspired word, your inspired word, Lord. Lord, allow us to read it, dig into it, learn from it, and apply it in our lives, Lord. Lord, let other people see you through us. Lord, I know that each and every one of us may be the only Bible some people ever see. And if that's the case, Lord, let us speak to them. Let your word in our hearts speak to them and bring them into your fold, Lord. Because, Lord, if we don't reach the lost, then what good is our life? What good is it for you to give us an amazing word that we not apply it and share it with others? What good is something so amazing if we keep it to ourselves? Lord, just give us the strength and the bravery in this harsh and perverse world we live in today where it gets harder every day. Just give us the strength to share your word with those people, Lord, and bring them into your house. Lord, not just our church, but bring them to any Bible-believing church where sound doctrine is teached, Lord. And Lord, those who are lost, those who have heard false doctrine, Lord, let them see the light and see the error of it that they may draw close to you and come to know you in glory. In your son's precious holy name, amen.